Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 86 of the Tick Bootcamp podcast. The title of today's interview is The Bluebird, an interview with Jody Hudson. My name is Richard Johannesson. And I'm Matt Sabatello. Today, Jody Hudson joins the Tick Bootcamp podcast on behalf of her daughter, Alex. Before we begin, we would like to give you a trigger warning. We know that many of our listeners are limeys who are also in the midst of the toughest battle of their lives. Jody and Alex's story is an extremely emotional story. So we'd like to advise you to proceed with caution if you feel that you may not be in the correct emotional state to listen to this episode. Ms. Hudson is from Fresno, California. Her daughter, Alex, grew up a typical healthy girl who loved to play sports. However, when she was in fifth grade, Alex started to experience joint pain and inflammation. Doctors ran different tests, but found nothing wrong. They dismissed Alex as a medical mystery for 10 years. Alex graduated from high school and was awarded a full scholarship to her dream school, UCLA. Unfortunately, Alex had to return home from college after her first week of school. In May of 2017, after seeing over 40 doctors, Alex was correctly diagnosed with Lyme via an Igenix test. Unfortunately, the diagnosis came too late. Lyme triggered mast cell activation syndrome in Alex, and the two diseases destroyed her body. She was never able to gain control of her illness and passed away in March of 2018. A bluebird would visit Alex each day while she was sick, and she knew that it was God's way of giving her another day on earth. Ms. Hudson asked Alex how she would know that Alex was with her after she passed. Alex said all she would have to do was look for the bluebird. Throughout the entirety of her life, Alex was service-oriented. Once she was diagnosed, Alex wanted to help people with Lyme disease. Ms. Hudson is carrying on her daughter's legacy through the Alex Hudson Lyme Foundation. She has become a national Lyme advocate and aims to increase research efforts, provide grants, support, education, and awareness. Hey, Jody Hudson, welcome to the Tick Bootcamp podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to speak with you today. Jody, can you introduce yourself to our listeners? Absolutely. So my name is Jody Hudson, and I am the CEO and founder of the Alex Hudson Lyme Foundation. I also, for the past 10 years, have been involved in the nonprofit world. I was at Catholic Charities as the operations director for 10 years. And then recently, um, as of December 2019, I joined Girl Scouts of Central California South as their development director. So I'm trying to balance basically two full-time jobs right now. Can you share with us what the purpose of the Alex Hudson Lyme Foundation is? Oh my goodness, yes. So my daughter, my 22-year-old daughter passed away March of 2018 from Lyme disease and mast cell activation syndrome. And one of the promises that I made her was to carry on her legacy and basically carry on the torch that she originally had started from her, her bedside. She became a very fierce Lyme advocate, and she was really trying to help others, especially those that did not have people that believed in their journey, whether it be from their families or the medical community. She showed a lot of empathy, and she really wanted to make sure that she was able to, to reach out to others. And when we knew that God had a, another plan for her journey, she told me to pick up that torch and carry it. So the Alex Hudson Lyme Foundation was formed in June of 2018. And our goal is really a couple of things. We want to raise funds for research, for education um, with both Lyme disease and mast cell activation syndrome, and also have a lot of grassroots efforts here locally in the Central Valley where we're educating our children and providing them with Lyme disease books in their elementary schools. So we've been very busy. We've been up and running for about a year and a half, and we've already raised $50,000 and have co-sponsored a research grant with the Global Lyme Alliance that's named after Alex Hudson. And we have also um, raised funds to purchase those Lyme books that will be given to 150 Fresno and closed elementary schools this coming May. So very busy, um, but very blessed to, to do great work on behalf of Alex. So Jody, can you share with us when Alex's tick disease journey began? When did she first start to show the symptoms of what ultimately became her tick disease? Yes. Yeah, so I remember it clear as day. She was in fifth grade and Alex um, had always been a very active child. She was a stellar athlete, even at seven, eight years old. She was doing soccer. She was doing softball. 
she was doing dance, you name it. She was just always very active. In fifth grade, she was running track and she started having joint pain and, and inflammation pain. And it started in the knees and it worked its way down to the ankles. And I remember we were always wrapping up her ankles and wrapping up her knees and she just was in a lot of pain all the time. So, you know, we started taking her to the children's hospital here and started, you know, the round of doctors and they thought, well, she's just a, a very active girl and her body's just being overworked from all the sports that she had been playing in. But then when she was playing basketball, she literally was carried off the basketball court because her knees just ballooned up. She, she couldn't walk. She had to be transported off. And we went back through the round of tests again. And we were sent to um, UCLA, Stanford, the best hospitals. And basically they told us that we know something is wrong with your daughter, but we can't figure it out. Tests are coming back inconclusive. And maybe it's something that will show up later on in life through different tests through different blood tests, but, um, you know, she's basically a, a medical mystery. And that's what we were told. And that's what we had to walk out of the doctor's office with and, and deal with for several years. At that time in Alex's life, were you aware of ticks and was Alex aware of ticks? And were you taking any precautions to do any tick checks? <laughs> Not at all. In fact, I tell people, you know, if I knew then what I know now, Alex would be here today. I mean, it'd be a whole different story. But unfortunately, out on the West Coast, back in, you know, when Alex was in fifth grade, Lyme disease wasn't wasn't talked about. I mean, even when she was officially diagnosed in May of 2017, I even said to myself, what is Lyme disease? I, I thought it was something that just happened out on the East Coast, or it was a disease that didn't impact us out here. So um, we were very ill-prepared to, to deal with this. When did you first begin to even think about Lyme disease in the journey? Was it after it was brought up by a doctor, or was it something that you started to develop ideas about as the medical community was failing your daughter? Like I said, we had not even heard about Lyme disease until Alex was finally um, officially diagnosed in May of 2017. So basically for 10 years, Alex had to suck it up. She had to, you know, bear this, this pain, bear this joint inflammation. She, after sixth grade, could never run again. I mean, how do you tell a child who identifies with their whole purpose in, in life, besides going to school, was with sports? I mean, she was going to, you know, she was already looking at being recruited by Fresno State as a softball pitcher. Everything in her world focused around sports. So how do you tell your child that she can't do that any longer. It was devastating for her. And we just thought, you know, maybe it's hereditary genetic. Maybe there's just something wrong that she cannot run. And she has this, you know, these inflammation issues. And she actually had knee surgery done because they thought maybe she had something wrong with, with her knees. So she, she battled this for several years and then she started having digestive issues and it just was never getting any better. But nowhere along this whole 10 year journey was Lyme disease ever talked about. In fact, leading up to her diagnosis in May of 2017, we spent six months in and out of ERs because she was developing a lot of other symptoms. She had air hunger, she had um, you know throat closure issues and it all went to psychiatric issues. They looked at this young girl that was losing weight and they thought, oh, she probably has an eating disorder. Oh, she's got anxiety. I mean, nobody ever talked about Lyme disease until this 40th doctor actually said, I think her symptoms align with Lyme disease. And that's when I had to Google it because Alex and I had no idea what Lyme disease was. Jody, before this 40th doctor thought Lyme, was Alex misdiagnosed with anything else other than a mental health issue? She was diagnosed with fibromyalgia, which is a, you know, basically a doctor telling you that they don't know what's wrong with your, your child. She was diagnosed with that. She was diagnosed with some ulcers because we didn't know then that she had Lyme disease and that Lyme disease impacts every organ in your body. And her stomach was giving her lots of problems. I just thought, again, maybe she was anxious because 
as a parent, we go to the doctors to get answers, right? Because we're not a doctor, so we rely upon the medical community. And the medical community kept telling us over and over again that she's just an anxious child. Well, when people don't believe in you, and Alex knew that there was something wrong with her, but when people keep discounting you, you start thinking that you're crazy. You start thinking maybe your daughter has an eating disorder. In fact, I even put her in a car and drove her to Sacramento and was ready to check her into an eating disorder clinic because that's what my doctors were telling me. So it was, it was terrible not being believed. And one day I remember trying to get a handle on this. I said, Alex, how am I going to best represent you when we go to these doctors? Because I'm still trying to figure out what is wrong with you. I said, I need you to write down on a piece of paper everything that's bothering you. Well, not only did she fill the front page, but she filled the back page as well. And I looked at her and I said, all this is, is bothering you? She said, yes, mom, and you need to believe me. She goes, I'm not making this up. And so when I saw it in black and white in writing, I didn't, I, I knew that she wasn't making this up. Nobody sits down and writes down all these things just because they want somebody to feel sorry for them. Jody, I'd like to explore with you a little bit about how these developing symptoms were affecting your daughter socially. Was she be, becoming isolated because she was sick all the time? So, like I said, her um, peer group definitely changed because when you're in school, you identify with those that have similar activities. So all of her sports friends, all of her cheerleading friends, all of her dance friends, they moved forward and Alex didn't move forward. So she had to find new friends, which was very tough going into junior high and high school. So her circle of friends definitely grew smaller as she started developing digestive problems and food allergies that became hard because kids go out and have pizza after sporting events and other things. And Alex had to start really, you know, watching her, her diet because she was, didn't really know what was triggering things. And she was getting fearful of eating out in public because she didn't know what would happen. So it was very painful as a parent seeing that your child is having, you know, medical issues that you can't pinpoint because the doctors don't know what it is. But then also social um, and emotional issues. So it was, it was tough. It was really tough. So initially the, the Lyme disease, the, un, the undiagnosed Lyme disease took away her athletic activities and then took yes. away her social contacts. How else did uh, the Lyme disease progress and what else did it take from her? So it took her, it took her education at the end. She was able to graduate from high school and she decided that she didn't want to go away to college um, in the beginning because we were still trying to figure out what was going on with her. So she stayed home and, and went to JC. And then she felt like she was maybe turning the corner and, and feeling a little bit better. And we were trying to grapple with her, her weight and her joint pains and whatnot. And so she said, I think I'm I'm ready to, to go away to school now. So she started sending out college applications and they started rolling in. I mean, she was a 4.0 student. She had a full ride scholarship to UCLA. We actually took her down there, moved her in for about a week and just walking across campus, it just wore her out. So she had to come back home and she didn't give up on her college pursuit. She actually went online and was still taking classes through ASU because she was determined that no matter, you know, even if her body wasn't keeping up with her, her mind was still keeping up with her. And she was determined to, to get that college degree. And yeah, it just really makes me sad thinking about it because she wanted to be a Bruin so bad. And that was such a big goal. And she ne never was able to achieve that goal. Well, she was a Bruin. <laughs> If only for one week, she was still a Bruin. So let's not, let's not <laughs> That's true. think that was taken away from her. One of the, one of the things that we see, Jody, with a lot of our guests, especially our young guests, is that they yeah. often find even family members abandoning them. And you were, you were kind enough to share that you had your doubts at times um, about whether or not she was suffering from anorexia or something else. Were there other family members who, who had been supportive of her before she was sick that ultimately lost faith in her and their relationship? Yes, she, um, so her father and I 
divorced in 2011, and basically Alex and I lived together, and our son went back and forth. But because Lyme disease is such a complicated disease, and it's the invisible disease, and it's nothing that people can really look at you and say, oh, yes, you have Lyme disease, I think it's hard for for people to really understand this disease. And it was definitely difficult for her father and difficult for her grandmother and and other individuals that were close to her to to understand what was going on with Alex. So, yeah, it was it was tough. We didn't have that, you know, buy-in support. And she and I really that last year did a cross-country journey together. It was Alex and I trying to to figure this out. So imagine, you know, our bond grew even stronger because we really had to lean on each other for emotional support and just believe in each other and say, you know what, we're going to get this figured out. So that that was tough not having support. So Jody, was there ever a time when Alex was doubting whether she herself was sick? You did share with us that she gave you the list of all the symptoms that she had so that you could better advocate for her with the medical professionals. But do you think there was ever a time when she doubted whether or not she was actually physically sick? No, Alex had such a strong conviction. And I think just witnessing that in my daughter is one of the things that I always talk about when I share Alex's journey and and her story about being your own advocate. Alex knew that there was something wrong with her and she was not going to, to give up. I mean, she was the one who really pressed me to, to keep moving forward because a lot of times I would give, I, I wouldn't say I would give up, but I would just be so frustrated not getting answers, but she kept pushing me. I mean, she had so much determination and grit. I mean, people think I do, and I pale in comparison to my daughter. I mean, she was amazing, this amazing warrior that just knew that there was something wrong and she knew her body and she was so in tune with it. And she knew that there was something wrong and she was not going to give up until she found answers. And it was Alex, not me, that actually found the doctor who diagnosed her with Lyme disease. How did the Lyme journey impact your daughter spiritually? So Alex was Catholic. We went through all of the sacraments. But during her dark years in, in junior high and high school, when she was feeling more of social isolation and having her circle of friends being limited. It was really, it was really tough. She went through a period where she didn't want to go to church. She was really questioning God. She was very angry. And I think that's very typical of, of people when they, you know, have things going on in their life and they, they can't figure out what's going on it's easy for us just to to blame God and think that, you know, God has created all of this, but she, she towards the end, definitely, like I would say within the last six months before she passed away, had this beautiful spiritual transformation. And it was a, she was, you know, taking on all of the redemptive suffering for the world. This daughter of mine was so amazing. She never took any pain medication I mean, I would be the first person if I had a headache or something that would take Tylenol or or whatnot, but Alex wanted to be so present with her suffering and really identify with it. And she, she just never took any, any pain medication. And within the last couple of months when she was bedridden and all she could do was read, I mean, fortunately Lyme disease did not take that away from her. She still was able to read a book a day and she really became immersed in the Bible. And she wanted to really explore her faith and really understand her faith in a much different light than she ever had before. And so she asked if there was somebody that could come into the home and kind of be like our our prayer couple, because she really needed to continue to have that motivation and that spirituality strengthened. So we were able to reach out to George and Kathleen, a a prayer couple here at our church, and they came in a couple times a week, and they just prayed with Alex, and they brought her books, and George was just so taken by Alex. He said, you know, at 22 years of age, 
she understands more about the theology and the spirituality of our religion and faith than most people do at 60 or, or 70 years old. And the questions that she would ask of him would just blow me away. I mean, she really wanted to understand this redemptive suffering and what she was taking on for not only herself with her pain and suffering, but people in the Lyme community and others that were battling diseases or sicknesses. Several people told me that they felt she was a modern day saint. And I really believe that she was put here for 22 years to do such amazing work, but she knew towards the end that she would have greater blessings from above. And that's why on March 24th, you know, she, she opened up her eyes one last time and had this big smile on her face. And she closed her eyes again, and she knew that her greater days were ahead of her. And the blessings that she has shown to me and others since she's passed, I, I have no doubt that she was a modern-day saint, for sure. Jody, can you walk us through how Alex's symptoms progressed from the time she was 10 years old up until the time she got diagnosed at 21 years old. You mentioned she started with some bone pain and joint pain and progressed to being bedridden. Can you walk us through the gap in between there? Sure. So like I said, you know, it started with the, the joint pain and the inflammation. And when I look back on it, I remember um, there was a week where she was really, really sick with like flu-like symptoms and her, her friend was as well. And I don't know if that was, you know, maybe the, the, the start of, of all of this with the, these flu-like symptoms, but so it started with the joint pain and the inflammation, and then that was always present. Like I said, she was never able to, to run again, but then the other big symptom was the digestive, and, you know, she had to see different GI um, doctors. She had to limit her diet. She had to really be careful as far as different food allergies. So those were really the the main symptoms. And then she started developing, which I would find out later was more of the mast cell activation syndromes with the throat closures, with having different bumps and hives on her, her body, being able to only drink certain brands of water. I mean, you think about that. You, you think, oh, you know, anybody can just drink a glass of water. Well, with Alex, it was like a certain brand that she could only drink. Otherwise, she would have these um, reactions. So those were really the, the main symptoms with her. And then, of course, just feeling lethargic and, you know, hard to, to get out of bed in the, in the morning. But her mind was always very sharp. Jody, you mentioned that Alex actually found her doctor that ultimately diagnosed her with Lyme when she was 21. So can you walk us through how she found this doctor, who he was, and the diagnosis process? Sure, absolutely. So like I said, we, you know, we're beginning our journey in and out of doctor offices here in Fresno and just being turned away, um, having, you know, everybody just look at Alex and look at me like we were psychotic and that, you know, this was all being made up in her head and everybody just wanted to write her a prescription for anxiety medication. And Alex, you know, we, we would have these waves where we would go strong and, and try and figure out a doctor who was going to be able to really give her that diagnosis. And then we would be frustrated and we would retreat and then we would, you know, start this journey all over again. And one day she was sitting on the couch and she was just going online, looking at, you know, different doctors. And again, like I said, she was just always determined to figure out what was going on with her because she knew her body and she knew something was not right. And I remember she was looking online and she goes, mom, she goes, I think I found the doctor that's going to be able to help me. And I said, you did? Where? And she said, look, look at this doctor. He is really good with digestive issues, but he also thinks outside of the box and he does a lot of different testing that other doctors haven't done before. And he's right down here in LA and he's associated with Cedar sinai And at this time, like I said, this was like her 40th doctor and flippantly, I'm like, yeah, whatever. All right. You know, let's try one more doctor. What's it going to, you know, matter. And sure enough, that was the, that was the doctor that 
after an hour and a half of Alex talking to him about her symptoms and her whole journey, he looked at Alex and then he looked at me and he said, Mrs. Hudson, has anybody ever talked to your daughter about Lyme disease before? And that's when I ignorantly said, what is Lyme disease? No, I've never heard of Lyme disease before. And he said, well, I'd like to get some testing done um, and, you know, we'll let you know in, in 30 days. And I remember I was sitting at a board meeting at Catholic Charities that was in May of 2017. And Alex came and got me out of my board meeting. And she said, Mom, she goes, we got the test results back. And I have Lyme disease. And we just went into my office and we just looked at each other and started crying. And it was, it was bittersweet. It was like we were so glad that we finally, after all these years, had a diagnosis, right? We weren't crazy. We actually had something on a piece of paper that we could tell people, look, believe us. You know, this is what she's been battling for 10 years. But at the same time, we didn't really know what to do with that piece of paper. We're like, what do we do now with this Lyme disease diagnosis? So, yeah, that was, I remember that day like it was just yesterday. Sure. Did you recall the kind of test that was performed? Was it a regular Western blot through your local lab or was it sent away to like an Igenix or a DNA connections? It was, he did the Igenix test and that's where it was confirmed that she had, you know, the Lyme disease with multiple co-infections. Now, Jody, you shared with us that there were some times in your relationship with your daughter during this journey that you had some doubts. Did this diagnosis that you finally received by this uh, Igenix test put you in a position where you were angry at the medical community for failing you and your daughter and causing some doubt at times in your mind about whether or not your daughter was sick? You know what? I wasn't angry. I was more vindicated, I think. I think it gave me a surge of energy, like, okay, we've been battling this for 10 years. I know that I'm not crazy. I know that my daughter's not crazy. And at that moment, I was very naive. I said, okay, great. We've got this diagnosis. You know, as parents, we're the fix-it people, right? Our child has an issue. They come to us. We fix it. And so I thought, great. We've got this diagnosis. I'm going to be able to fix it. I'm going to find the best hospital, facility. I'm going to get this knocked out. And in a couple of weeks, she's going to be feeling better. All this is just going to be a, a you know, bad memory, a, a bad nightmare. We're going to, you know, wash out the, the past 10 years of her life. And I'm also going to go back to the doctors to let them know, hey, you might want to start checking people for Lyme disease because my daughter was told that she was a medical mystery, but if you guys would have done this testing, you would have realized that, you know, there, there was something else here. So it was more of indication. It was more of an educational tool for me to go back to her doctors with, but it was also like, hmm, I've got this diagnosis and I thought we were going to wrap this up and put a bow on it. And Alex was going to be able to, to move on with her life. And that was furthest from the truth. Were you able to use this positive test as a tool to explain to people who were doubting her that she was in fact sick? So for example, were you able to talk with her dad about the positive test and that, did that change his relationship with your daughter? So yes, I, I was. I, when I told them that she had Lyme disease, they still were like, well, no, how, how can that be? So I remember taking a snapshot of the results. I remember sending it over to them. And then they started believing, okay, wow, she does have Lyme disease. But then, you know, therein lies the problem. Once you find out that you have Lyme disease, how do you treat it? And, you know, they, because they had not been on this journey so intimately with my daughter, wanted to just go to, you know, a regular doctor and do 30 days of antibiotics or do a really short-term you know, treatment. And I mean, it was, it was hard. It's like, I, I, you know, gave them the, the test results. And then I felt like I had to educate them, but I didn't have time to educate them and bring them up to speed. I had to now turn my attention to my daughter and really find out how I was going to get her better. So, um, so that was hard. It, it was hard. You know, I, I couldn't 
give full attention to both. And that's the thing about Lyme disease, you know, trying to educate individuals that don't understand it. I mean, there's still so much work to be done with that, but I just, at that time, had to turn my energies on, on my daughter and just try and, and get her better. Jody, what was the treatment plan at this point now that you finally had a Lyme diagnosis for Alex, and how did that progress? So Alex and I, um, once we got that diagnosis, we sat down, and she and I started just looking online, looking at the best you know, facilities. I remember also, you know, it's ironic that in May, she was diagnosed with Lyme disease, which May is Lyme Awareness Month, right? There was a TV station here, KC24, that had just ran a Lyme awareness segment with three individuals. One of these ladies lived here locally. Two others lived about maybe two hours away. So I reached out to my friends at KC24 and said, hey, my daughter just got diagnosed with Lyme disease. You just had three women on your show talking about it. I need to speak to these women because I don't know how to help my daughter. I don't know anything about Lyme disease, but I'm hoping maybe they can, you know, put me on the, the right path. So that was one thing that I did. The other thing that I did was, you know, we live in the world of social media and you can put things out in social media and get responses pretty quick. Like, and I did that. I asked Alex if she was okay with me sharing it publicly that she was diagnosed with Lyme disease. And I thought maybe that would help to um, give me some information much quicker than me doing it on my own. So I put out a Facebook post and I had a lot of people reach out to me and tell me about, you know, doctors that they had used before and just to kind of give me some information. So then Alex and I could look at all this information and decide upon the path that we wanted to choose. One of these gals that was on the KC24 show, like I said, lived here locally. So I called her up, Alex and I went over and met with her and she shared with us her journey. She had been in treatment for about a year and a half and it was very eye-opening. At the time when Alex and I walked through the door of her home, I thought, oh my gosh, I don't know if I've done the right thing because she was hooked up to an IV. Her counter was full of all of these pills and supplements. And I'm thinking, okay, she's got to be a hypochondriac. There's no way possible that one person needs to take all these supplements, right? And Alex was just looking at all this medication too, thinking, oh my gosh, is that going to happen to me? But it was, it was really good. It was, it was a good talk. And she actually led us to her doctor, which became Alex's main doctor. But then as we know, Lyme disease impacts every organ in your body. And Alex eventually had about 12 or 13 doctors working on her case because she needed somebody for the heart. She needed somebody for the digestive. So yeah, we started, we started building our team. We also started going out to different facilities. We took her to the Sophia Health Institute for about a week. We took her to the Hansa Center for about three weeks. I mean, we were just trying everything. Did you ever have any concerns about having adequate resources to provide all of this care to your daughter? So again, you know, sometimes we don't understand God's plan until we actually have a moment to, to look back and reflect on it. I lost my parents. I lost my mom in 2003 and I lost my dad a couple of years before Alex passed away. And uh, I had sorry. a little bit of a... Thank you. And I had a little bit of a, a nest egg from my dad. So fortunately, I was able to use that money to help Alex that, that last year. So from 2017 until she passed in March of 2018, I spent over $80,000, wiped out my whole little nest egg. Because remember, I'm single mom, divorced in 2011. So I was doing everything on my own. So yeah, it was, it was tough. Had I not had that little nest egg, I don't think that I would have been able to afford all of the different facilities that I took Alex to. We ended up selling Alex's car that she had because she said, mom, she goes, why do I need this car? She said, it, you know, I, I need treatment more than I need a, a car. So, I mean, we were selling everything that we could to afford her care because 
I was the only one providing for it. Insurance, of course, you know, didn't pay for a lot of that treatment. But we all know as parents, you would sell anything to, to save your child, right? Jody, can you walk us through in more detail what treatments you actually got for Alex when she first got diagnosed? So the week that we stayed at Sophia Health Institute, we did a lot of different IVs, lots of different supplements, herbs. Um, we didn't really start on any antibiotics. She wanted to try and do things all natural. But we found out that when we were there, she actually was getting a lot sicker. And that's because she was developing the, the mast cell activation symptoms. And, and that's the thing. That's the really tricky thing when you start treatment. You don't know what's going to offset other symptoms, right? So we were there for about a week. And when I brought her home, we decided to go and see a doctor that had been recommended to us out on the, the coast. And he was a neuropathic doctor. And so when we went and saw him and we showed him the whole array of supplements and whatnot that had been recommended for Alex, her, her protocol at Sophia, he whittled everything back. And he was the one that actually said, you know, I think the reason why she got worse is because a lot of these things that she's taking are impacting the mast cell symptoms. So we stripped back a, a lot of her protocol. We put her on a couple of antibiotics. We started doing some other IVs just to really start strengthening up her immune system. But because her body was starting to lose weight, we had to really be careful. When she started this journey, she was about 120 pounds. When she passed away, she was only 57 pounds. So we had to really be careful when we introduced new supplements and, and treatments to, to tread lightly. Even the, the antibiotics, we had to get everything through a compounding pharmacy because she was reacting to even the pills, even to the exterior shell of her antibiotics. So it was, it was, it was crazy. It was so confusing. It was so hard. But that was what we did in the beginning of her journey. When we went to the Hansa Center, it was more of the herbal treatments. It was, you know, trying to do some emotional therapy as well, trying to retrain the brain. Because when you've been chronic for so long, your body tends to react in certain ways. So we were trying to retrain the, the brain into to thinking of healthy and imagining her body healthy again. So we did a lot of those type of, of treatments as well. I mean, I could go on and on. There's, there's so much that we went through, but it was mainly, you know, the antibiotics, herbal treatment, doing the emotional therapy, doing detoxing, which is really important. People don't tell you about that. The diet, you know, making sure that she was eating certain foods. And towards the end, I would say like within the last six to eight months, she was only able to eat about four or five different foods because of all of the the mast cell complications. So it was, it was tough. It was hard trying to, to figure out protocols. I mean, we'd be on a protocol for a couple months and we wouldn't see any change. And so we would, you know, scratch that and, and try a different one. And, you know, that's the problem with Lyme. You just don't know what protocol, what treatment is going to work because everybody reacts differently and everybody has different symptoms. And I feel that because Alex went, 10 years misdiagnosed by the time that we got that diagnosis, we could just never get a, a leg up on her treatment. We never saw any improvement. It was like just chasing this disease that just kept going on a, a downward spiral. Jody, you mentioned that many treatment options that you chose to try activated MCAS or mast cell activation syndrome. Can you talk to us in more detail what MCAS is? So mast cell activation syndrome is basically a increase of your histamine level. So all of us have histamine levels in our body, which is a good thing. But those that have chronic illnesses or their autoimmune is out of whack, they have overactive histamine levels. And basically what that is, is imagine eating 
a slice of pizza and you eat that every day and one day you eat it and your body just starts reacting violently to it. You drink, you know, a soda every day and you drink it one day and you start having throat closures and, and other problems, whether it be hives or whether it be different allergic reactions to it. And what's happening is your histamine levels are are signaling that this is like a, a foreign substance. This is something that's not good for your body. And so it starts shooting out massive amounts of histamine levels, which then triggers all these different receptors in your body. So in a Lyme person, you already have that joint pain, you already have that inflammation pain, you already feel real crappy. Well, then now it's magnified a thousand percent by these histamine levels. So every time Alex tried to eat something, these histamine levels would just start shooting off. And she was in pain. I mean, she forced herself to eat because she knew that she needed nourishment, but she literally was in tears every meal trying to eat because of these histamine levels. So we tried with different medications and different H1 and H2 blockers to try and get those histamine levels down. And it was just, you know, it's just a, a hard science trying to, to figure out exactly the right dosages of things and things that wouldn't upset her, her Lyme disease. So it was a fine um, line that we always tried to to balance and we just can never, we can never get it right. Jody, was there a test for MCAS that was performed or did your doctor just know that it's a common symptom or byproduct of having Lyme disease? So hers was based upon clinical symptoms and we also conferred with Dr. Afrin who is a mast cell specialist out in New York. And you talk about a doctor who is so committed to his practice. And he always took my calls. He would take my calls from hospitals when Alex was being admitted because we were so concerned that, you know, even if she had a a certain IV put in her arm or if she had a certain latex glove touch her, that something could be triggered with her, her mast cells. And he was so incredible. I mean, he always just walked us through the process You know, it's just, it was so hard trying to be the patient and the doctor at the same time because Alex and I always felt every time she was admitted to the hospital, okay, who's going to believe us? Who do we have to educate today? It was hard enough trying to get people to believe that, you know, Alex had Lyme disease, even though we had multiple books full of all of her test results and from Igenics and whatnot stating that she had this disease, but then to also talk to them about mast cell activation syndrome and, hey, you know, be careful with that because my daughter could react to that, you know, Playtex or what's in that saline solution. And I mean, they looked at us like we were crazy. Jody, you also mentioned in your pre-interview questionnaire that EMF reduction at home was an important part of what you did to help. So can you talk to us what that means and why it could be helpful to reduce EMF frequencies in your home? Yes, and and thank you for bringing that up. You know, it's it's hard. There were so many things that happened in in that year that we researched and really, you know, trying to to figure out how we could reduce the, the pain and the suffering that Alex was going through. And we found that with EMF, you know, you don't realize all of the wireless activity that's going on in your home and, you know, your electronics and making sure that you're turning off your electronics at nighttime and just all the EMF reduction in your home, how that can, you know, trigger things in in your body. And I remember clearly one day Alex was in the kitchen and she walked to the bedroom and she said, oh my gosh, she goes, I feel so much better being back in this bedroom than I am in the kitchen. And I didn't realize that we had like our hot water meter over by the kitchen and, and other things that really were, you know, causing more, more disruption in, in, her, in her body. So we went online and we actually found different devices that you can attach to your hot water meter and your TV and, and other things in your home that can help reduce EMF. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that 
you can do to help, you know, counter some of these Lyme disease symptoms. And it'd be great if somebody had a whole guide or like, you know, the idiot guide to Lyme disease, right? I mean, what we learned in, in one year's time was, it was amazing. Jordy, you also mentioned that you had tried a Rife machine as well with Alex. Can you talk to us if you felt that was beneficial in any way? These Lyme disease support groups on, on Facebook, some of them are really good. Some of them are not so good. But we were able to kind of sift through the information that was, that was out there online and through these Facebook support groups about things that were working for people, things that weren't working for people. And we had heard a lot about the, the rife treatment. And so I had reached out to an individual that knew of somebody back in Pennsylvania, of all places, that um, had really good success with their daughter. And they felt that it helped reduce a lot of her um, inflammation and symptoms. So again, during that whole year of cross-country checks, that was one of our stops that we made. And I took Alex out to Pennsylvania. And we went through about a week of the, the right treatment. And I think had she not had the, the mast cell activation symptoms that this would have worked for her. But unfortunately, the right treatment did not bode well for her. In fact, I think it caused a little bit more of a, a flare up with her, with her, her mast cell. So that did not work for us. But I know other people have had really great results with it. Again, you know, unfortunately, Lyme is not like cancer, where cancer is tried and true. You, you know, go through chemotherapy, you have certain steps for cancer. With Lyme, it's kind of like a buffet, you know, do you choose number one, two, three, four, five for your symptoms and, and for your treatment? That's the, the real hard thing about Lyme disease. You just never know what's going to help your symptoms. Did at any point you try CBD oil or any CBD products to help with some of the pain and symptoms while she was going through all this treatment? So she tried CBD oil, but she felt like she, again, with the, the mast cell, that she did not react well to it. It had a negative effect with her, which I was really puzzled because a lot of people say that that helps them. But again, because of that, that mast cell, there was a lot of things that Alex couldn't do with her protocol because of that. Can you walk us through what things were like towards the end of, of the first year of her diagnosis and what it was like on a daily basis for you and Alex at your home? So let me walk you through December. So May 2017, she was diagnosed. We were doing this cross-country trek all over the place trying to, to figure out how we could get her better. And so it's December of, of 2017, and she passed in March of 2018. So that was just a couple of months before she passed away. And December was really a big month for us because we had just gotten back from Hansa Center. We had just tried a lot of different therapies. Alex was not getting better. And she, she really was, I don't want to say in a, in a bad place, but she was starting to, to waver a little bit. But her spirituality and her whole transformation really started taking off in, in the beginning of December. And she loved December because it was her birthday month. Her birthday was December 20th. And she loved Christmas. She always loved Christmas as, as a child. And because her faith was really starting to ignite, she really thought that Christmas was going to be her month. We kept saying that this is it. You are going to be the Christmas miracle. And I get so sad thinking about that, even talking about it, because, I mean, that was really what we were shooting for. She was going to be that Christmas miracle and, and things were going to turn. And she was in a wheelchair at that point because it was really hard for her to, to walk. And she was able to go to church on, on Christmas. And that was the last time that she ever went to church. Because after that point, you know, we had talked about the EMFs and, and the sounds and the, the music and everything. And it was just too much for Alex to be in a, in a big public setting with lots of music and lots of noise. So that was the last time that she was able to participate in a group service. 
But we came home from that mass and we had a very quiet Christmas Eve. And the next day she was in bed and I was out just in the living room dusting things and I looked outside and I saw this bluebird. And I'd never seen this bluebird before and I thought, wow, that's really interesting. I wonder if Alex has seen this bluebird. So I walked into the bedroom and I said, Alex, I go, have you seen this bluebird that's out in the courtyard? And she said, yes, mom. She goes, I've seen that for quite some time. And I said, really? I go, what does that mean to you? She said, well, I know I have another day here on earth and I know that God hasn't forgotten about me. And then we started talking about how, you know, the Christmas miracle, did it, did it come? Did she feel any better? And, and she didn't feel any better. But at that moment, she knew that she wasn't supposed to be here on earth any longer. She knew that there was a greater calling and that there was a greater purpose for her life. And while she was sad that she wasn't going to be here any longer, and she, and she knew that, she was starting to transform in, into this next part of her life. And so January came and we started having hospice come into the home. And it wasn't really to take care of her because Alex didn't have any pain medication. So there wasn't really anything for them to administer to her. It was more just to check on her vitals and just for people to um, that didn't understand about Lyme disease and didn't understand why I didn't have my child in a hospital when she was so sick. Um, it was really to to protect Alex and it was to protect me as well. But that's when we started getting in this prayer couple. And this prayer couple really helped in Alex's transformation to the next journey that she would be taking when she, she passed away in March. And it was just so beautiful to witness that whole transformation and, and how when people would come and, and visit with Alex, they were just so taken away by her they said you know she's not the same child any longer and I said no she's not I said she is just really she's she's a gift and it's just amazing to witness this this transformation that that's taking place and she and I would have talks and because we were always so one in spirit because of everything that our journey had taken us on even prior to Lyme, just with the divorce and just everything in our lives, we truly were, were one. And I would tell Alex, I would say, you know, Alex, I don't know how I'm going to be able to live without you. I said, this is going to be really tough. And I said, but I, I know that you have a greater calling, but when I need to speak to you and I need to talk to you, how am I going to be able to do that? What sign are you going to give me? And she said, mom, always look for the bluebird. And so, like, even today, you know, it's like I'm doing this podcast and I'm looking outside and I see the bluebird there. And so she, she'll give me these signs when she knows that I'm really, you know, struggling or trying to retell the story just to give me that strength to keep moving forward. And so when she passed, I knew what the logo was going to be for her foundation. And if you look on our website, you'll see the bluebird there. And it's just always a reminder because if you know anything about bluebirds, bluebirds are the sign of hope. And that is what we are trying to do with our foundation is just to give people hope through Alex's legacy and just the hope that she gave everybody before she passed. She was so selfless in her last couple of months. She wasn't thinking about herself. She was really setting the stage for what was going to, to happen next. And I'm just so grateful that, you know, I had her in my life for 22 years. And, and we're, we're really blessed to have you share uh, the beauty of the 22 years that, uh, that she not only blessed you, but is now blessing all the rest of us with, uh, with this beautiful story. Jody, can you share with us what the future is for the foundation? So when I look back on when Alex passed away and, and when we formed this foundation in June of 2018, which was a miracle in itself. If anybody knows anything about 501c3s, you know that it, it takes a while to 
go through all the, the paperwork and, and have that done. Well, we petitioned for the 501c3 in June, and within 30 days, we received our letter. So I knew that right then and there, Alex had us set on this amazing course. And in the year and a half that we have had this foundation, it has just been such a, a blessing for so many people. You know, right off the bat, we were able to establish a $50,000 research grant that was named after Alex, and we co-sponsored that with Global Lyme Alliance out of New York. We've been also able to raise money to help local Lyme patients here to financially support their treatment, which was very important. Alex really wanted to make sure that through me, we were able to to help individuals that weren't able to pay for their treatment since we ourselves had to, you know, spend eighty thousand dollars out of pocket to to you know try and get her better. Our foundation is also very committed to working with children through children Lyme disease books, getting them out to all of the elementary schools and really creating that awareness so children can start educating their parents through doing different tick checks and and other things, just that prevention and that awareness. I'm also really excited to talk about the partnership that we have with Girl Scouts of Central California South with our foundation. We are launching a Lyme curriculum. I can't believe it hasn't been done yet, but we are gonna be launching a Lyme curriculum that Girl Scouts throughout the country will um, will be able to earn patches that will have the Alex Hudson Lyme Foundation logo on it, along with the Girl Scouts of Central California South logo. And that will be patches earned for different Lyme disease curriculum awareness. We have lots of lots of plans in, in store coming up for May for, for Lyme awareness. And it's just amazing in the year and a half that we have been formed, our, our depth, our range. I mean, look at, I'm talking to you guys today. I mean, we have gone national. People know about this foundation. People are, you know, looking at this foundation as something that you're able to take something that's very tragic and horrific, a death, and turn it into a positive. Alex never would have wanted me to to, to sit back and, and not do something positive with, with her death. And I think that's definitely the the driving force with this foundation is to make sure that I carry out her legacy to make her death meaningful to really help to inspire others and give people hope that despite what you are going through you know look look at my daughter she never gave up she was always hopeful to the end and to dig deep you know we all have personal things that happen in our lives we all have journeys that we're on, but never give up because you just don't know what might happen at the end and what good could come from it. So that's really what I want to inspire other people. You know, I don't want to be grief girl. I want to be able to inspire people and and let people know that there is good that that comes from bad things in your in your life. And it's really up to you to to turn and, and flip that. Thank you for listening to the Tick Boot Camp interview with Jody Hudson. To our listeners, we have a call to action. First, if you'd like to learn more about Jody Hudson and the Alex Hudson Lyme Foundation, please visit alexhudsonslymefoundation.org. Second, if you enjoyed this episode of the Tick Boot Camp podcast, please share it with your friends by using the social media buttons you see at the bottom of the post. Third, we here at Tick Boot Camp have created a Tick Bite Blueprint that has been inspired by the information that has been shared with us by past podcast guests. We urge you to visit our website at www.tickbootcamp.com to view the blueprint. We would appreciate it if you would contact us with any suggestions you have for improvements to the blueprint. Fourth, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play Music, or Spotify to get the automatic episode updates of our Tick Boot Camp podcast. And finally, we thank you, our listeners, for your comments on our past podcast episodes. Please take a minute to leave us an honest review on iTunes, on Instagram, or on our website. We make it a point to read every single one of the reviews we get. Thank you for listening.